I have not physically touched my son since he was 12 years old. Oh, man. Yeah, since he was 12 years old. Um, I have, let me show you something real quick. Um, man, that's just hitting me, you saying that, that you haven't physically touched your son in 10 years, 11. Yeah, since then. Since then. If it is my jam, if it is my jam, if it is my jam, 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 jam. I'm Chad. And I'm Tiffany. And, and this, this is, is Empathy, Empathy jam. jam. All right. So having Jimmy Vigil on the podcast here today. And uh, yeah, man, just like I said, like no, no type of um, formity or nothing. We're just getting started, me and my wife getting this uh empathy jam thing started and uh i'm just happy happy to connect with you almost randomly i was trying to think about like how did how did we start chatting it's been a few months right yeah yeah um i can't i can't really remember man um i remember oh i think i think i might have popped up on your um suggestions or something because you had seen a couple of the uh postings i had did some yeah. of the reels and you had told me you basically had uh commended me for the work that i do yeah yeah i was uh checking out your page and i was just like this dude is like i don't know it's interesting how you can kind of at least i'm guessing that i can that i can feel like i could connect with somebody just yeah. through that way you know what i mean yeah yeah of what of the stuff you make and and whatever but uh i mentioned maybe getting on here and and talking about you know whatever whatever comes up some of the stuff you're doing some of the stuff uh you've been through i was i was uh scrolling through and and trying to pick up on some stuff that you're you're into nowadays and yeah man just like trying to trying to hear different perspectives and, and, uh, you sound like you got a story. Oh man. Um, most definitely. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, <laughs> I know we all do, but, um, yeah, man. Uh, so like, as far as, you know, I know that you, you, you do a lot of, uh, music, you know, I, I, I've checked that out and, um, I'm connected to a good handful of people in the mu music industry as well as well. So, uh, I do a little bit of music promoting here and there on Instagram. Sweet. Um, there's a, a good friend of mine. He's been incarcerated since he was 16 years old and it's been 27 years. And, uh, he's at, uh, monster underscore yo on Instagram. And, yeah, he's he's been involved in the music industry. He actually makes music from in there and he's collaborated. He just collaborated with uh Rick Ross on a song. Um this is just, you know, pretty much uh the way life has been for us. You yeah. know, he has a life without the possibility of parole and we're just trying to do what we can to bring him home. His name is Ladaro Penix. And uh, for me, the situation was pretty similar. I had got in trouble as as a juvenile, and I had did a little bit of time in youth authority and got out and, you know, went on a straight and narrow for a little bit, fell back, ended up uh, in prison at 18, um, did 14 months off of a two-year bid, got out. I was having a hard time uh, obtaining employment. And I started selling drugs again and just, you know, out there in the mix of, midst of everything. And um, it was a few months after that, I ended up um, in an altercation with a couple individuals and I ended up uh, opening fire on both of them and picked up a 25 year sentence mm -hmm. and yeah, uh, brought over a couple decades off of that. And it's just it's it's basically you know uh a revolving door for people that grow up in a poverty stricken environment you know it's it's hard to break that mold yeah. i have a son that's uh 23 he's been incarcerated since he was 17 
he was three months old when I was arrested. Mm. And, you know, him and his sister, you know, I was in there their whole lives, man. So it, it's kind of uh, like, is this, Xavier? I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I, I heard you talk about your son, Xavier. Is that yeah. what you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. Xavier Vigil. Yeah. Man. Um. Yeah. It's just kind of rough, you know, I mean, for me, what helped me to break the mold. And unfortunately I was ready. What, like 34, maybe uh, my ex and my daughter had told me that my son, you know, he was mixed up in the lifestyle that he was a gang member. And he was like 13 at the time. And he had started getting in trouble with the law. And uh, I had that, uh, that epiphany where it's, it's kind of like, well, you know, I don't want this for my son. You know, why in the hell do I want it for me? So, um, yeah, that just kind of hit me. And then right there and then it was just baby steps, you know, um, I used to sell drugs while I was in prison and, uh, that was like one of the hardest habits to break. You know, I was never a drug user. I used to drink a lot, but, um, being able to, you know, just kind of steer away from selling drugs, from chasing money in there and just kind of trying to focus more on, on a positive path, you know? Yeah. And after a while it got, you know, it became a lot easier. I paroled with three college degrees, a certification in counseling. And, um, here I am, you know, I'm, I'm an art counselor for the fire department for, uh, Cal fire at the Ventura training center Academy yeah. in Camarillo, California. And there we run a second chance program for, some individuals who've been previously incarcerated uh, will accept them if they have uh, prior fire camp training, like if they were incarcerated at a fire camp. Mm -hmm. But we go above and beyond for these guys. We, you know, get their records expunged. Um, they get a badge, you know, at the end of the academy and they become official Cal Fire uh, firefighters. Yeah. And it's it's beautiful. You know, they get it. They get a second chance at life. And, you know. I wasn't really afforded that until after, you know, a couple decades, but I'm glad I'm here. I'm grateful. And, um, man, you know, I'm, I'm loving it. I'm loving life. Well, bro, I hear you, man. Like, just like I said, just experiencing you online and chatting back and forth. Some, I can hear the, the passion and the, the care and the experience. Um, so just to backtrack some, like, how old are you now? I'm 43. I'll, I'll be 43 next month. Okay. And, yeah. and uh, dur during, when did you get this news about your son that kind of like, you, you're basically explaining some kind of light, light bulb switch. Like, was it like that? Was it like um, immediately or was it like, it took a while to settle in to, to kind of reflect or like, how did, how did this change come about? Because I understand or I can uh, I can guess that I can understand of like where you come from and just like you're used to doing what you're doing. It's hard to it's hard to make any change in this life, like anything at all. Yeah. Let alone something is like big is what you're talking about. Yeah. Um. So like how? Man, I, I guess I was asking like how long were you in versus until you got this news. About 14 years, 15, yeah, about 14 years. Yeah, about 14 or 15 years, approximately. And when I was told what I was told by my ex pertaining to my son's lifestyle, it, it was immediate, man. You know, um, you know, not trying to uh, float my own boat or anything like that, but I've always been a pretty sharp dude. You know, you, you have to acquire um, a specific type of skill setting up here when you're, you know, I went through places like Pelican Bay, New Folsom, High Desert, uh, uh, you know, I went through some rough places and um, you learn to become a, a serious thinker in order for you to survive through a lot of stuff. And uh, it was immediate for me, man. It was just thinking back, you know, to everything that I had been through, because by the time that occurred, like I said, uh, I was like 34, 33, somewhere around there. So, you know, I wasn't old, but I, I wasn't too young anymore either, though. You know, I was old enough to have a firm understanding of, you know, what time it was in my life. And to be able to 
kind of see the path that my son was going down, I knew that he was going to be traveling down that same road Mm -hmm. and just, you know, common sense, you know, it kicked in and it was like, you know, I do not want this life for my son. Why in the hell do I want it for myself? And it was a struggle. Like I said, the hardest thing for me was, um, being able to stop selling drugs, man, because I was bringing in a lot of money that way. And, uh, that and then you know leaving the fellas alone you know i had gang ties and when when you were uh, you're, you're talking about selling drugs while you're in prison that's correct yeah, yeah that is and I, like i can only guess i'm just uh i'm just curious of like how do you switch that pattern with with just like i mean people that just <laughs> are outside and normal uh how do you change your friend group or how, like, I mean, people had to have a backlash of like, what is this dude trying to do? And yeah, how do you gradually make that shift? Even when you're consciously shift, shift. Um, well, but based on how old I was and everything that I had been through when this occurred, when, when I had found out about my son initially, I was in a level three uh, uh, institution, which is a security level. So you have four levels. One is minimum, two is medium, three is like a high medium, and four is maximum security. So I was on a level three already. I had never made it home uh, going anything less than a level three. I paroled from a level three institution. So, uh, and that was based, I was in a lot of trouble in the beginning. So, you know, my, my points were high and but by that time, I was already in a level three and I was a little bit older. I really didn't have to worry too much about anybody questioning me. Mm. Now, if they were, you know, whispering behind my back, wondering what was going on with me, if, you know, if I was switching up, if I was turning soft, what I, I was oblivious to it, you know, um, I was in a position already where I was able just to tell everybody, you know, this is what it is, whatever is going on in house. I don't need to know anything about it. You know, just I, keep it away from me. You know, I got a different focus. If Now, if something racial is getting ready to happen, then I need to know. You know what I mean? Because you can't avoid that. Yeah. But as far as like in-house gang politics and whatnot, I don't want to know who's snitched. I don't want none of that. My main focus is one is being able to stop selling dope up in this place, because that is. I think for me and. I think it's it's safe for me to speak for a lot of other men that that are sitting in there still. Drugs, they they cause a huge problem in there. You know, I mean, that's like the number one thing why individuals get into it is over money. And once I had a good support system, you know, I had a really good support system. So once I was able to break away from that, it was just it was life changing, man. It really was. And I wasn't broke. I had money saved up and, um, you know, I, I, I had a good support system that I were, were, you know, there was a lot of people behind me that, you know, they were rooting for me. And what do you mean by that? Uh, people like family members, my, you know, my spouse, um, uh, uh my, my, my sisters, I, I had different family members, you know, some cousins and whatnot. Um, that were there, you know, throughout the duration of my prison stay. And, uh, I was blessed to have that, you know, I know a lot of individuals don't, you know, they're in there and they're stuck by themselves with no support system on the outside. And they just fall deeper and deeper into, you know, that world up in there. It's a whole different world up in there, man, especially out here in California. Yeah. Um, and it, it's like in the very beginning for me, I didn't have time to focus on myself. I was so focused on prison politics and everything that was going on around me. And once I reached that point in life where I knew it was time to make a change based on what my son was going through, uh, uh, I was able to focus on me. You know, I was able to quit paying attention to what everybody else was going through and what they were doing. And I was able to really focus on myself and take that self inventory. And that helped a lot, man. It just, it, it really did. The sad thing with my son was, it was in 2000 and I want to say the beginning of 18, I was on the yard. I was exercising 
And they called my name over the loudspeaker to report to the program office and to see my counselor. So I'm like, you know, what is going on? It it was kind of odd to me. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I was, you know, within a couple of years of going home. So uh, uh, I stopped exercising. I go in and, you know, I I was uh, given the news that my son had just been shot. And that right there was just tragic, you know. So uh, he was him and two other boys. They were robbing a store. My son was 17 uh, going on. He was getting ready to turn 18, as a matter of fact. And um, yeah, it was just, you know, you know, being served that news right there in that office was like, like, man, what the hell? Like, yeah. you got to be kidding me. You know, I immediately just went back and, you know, I felt that pain and, you know, I was angry for a while and it was just, you know, a mixture of emotions and, um, that just made it even, you know, it made me even more determined to be able to, uh, continue to make the changes that I had been making, you know, to be able to set that example for him, yeah, you know, and then it was kind of like, I took it even more personal because I, I left, my family for that lifestyle, you know, when my kids were babies. So I ended up taking it upon myself to try to extend a hand to a lot of other individuals that were in there with me that were younger. You know, I I was working as a clerk in the college program. I was in school. I'd say I'd start work at like eight o'clock in the morning, got off at three from 3 PM until eight 30 at night. I was in school the program that we had, we had professors from uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and from uh, the local college, Cuesta College, coming in there. And they were, you know, they were actually teaching in the institution. And I would be in school Monday through Thursday from 3.30 to 8.30. Uh, Friday, I would work all day and then I would go to, uh, I was part of a uh, the AA committee, Alcoholics Anonymous, Mm-hmm. Um, that was another issue. That was another hard thing to kick too. was, you know, to leave alcohol alone. Um, and then Saturday I was facilitating a group, a self-help group for incarcerated men. Sunday night, I was facilitating a group for incarcerated fathers. So it was more or less just, you know, trying to give back to the community before I even, you know, returned back to society. Yeah. So you kind of had yeah. this routine of, uh, redesigning your life. Uh, I share, I share that, uh, the 12 step stuff as well. Okay. A, a lot of time in 12 step in the last six years. And, uh, so I hear right you. On. That's cool. Um, I was going to ask you that when you were talking about self inventory, I'm like, this dude is kind of yeah. stuff, dude. Um, so this is like, after you made this conscious change, and it sounds like what I'm hearing is that you had set up this routine, this weekly, these things that keep you going, and you're aiming towards uh, where you're aiming, that your change. Is, is that oh, right? Yeah. This, this, yeah. This, last, this last few years, like, because I know this is, I mean, we could talk all day for you to get into all the things you've probably been through and, and and the changes that you've been through. But I just, I just wonder, yeah, I just like, yeah, I have a lot of uh, questions of like what it was like, like, how do you, how do you make that conscious choice um, of choosing? I don't know if you want to call it the positive versus the, the negative way or the, or the, uh, you know, hope versus depression. And like, how many times do, are you going through that during those years and oh, the people yeah. around you? And like, do you guys support each other? Or is it just like like-minded people find each other or like, you know, are there, are there men in there talking about how they feel and stuff or, or is it just the grand spectrum of, of things? Um, well, you know, of course, there's basically there's different social groups. So uh, I want to say for the most part, you know, predominantly uh, you're surrounded by a bunch of negativity, man. You really are. And I went through years and years of waking up in the morning and just, you know, you got that feeling like, man, I'm so sick of being here. I don't even want to be here anymore. And 
uh, that was that was a big thing for me too. Was just being able to fight through that 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 mental struggle, that emotional struggle. Like how, uh, how long would that last at a time? Be like, I would just imagine like maybe you know how how long would that last? Like like a years or months or then once in a while something pops up that you're interested in and it kind of like keeps you going for a little while or or um that like for you i i think just i i was strong-minded you know where when i would wake up and i would have that feeling that was going on for years um but i had it in my head that I, you know i was not going to commit suicide that was out um when the thought would come into my mind uh i i just you know i would just do my best to remind myself that i'm stronger than that and i would keep pushing uh, I can't, it's, there's countless individuals that I, I, I don't even know how many individuals that I know who had taken their own life well up in there. And when it comes, I mean, I've seen, you know, there, I've seen people, you know, uh, fixated, you know, die that way, uh, individuals, you know, cutting their throats open, um, drug overdoses, you know, you name it. And, I've seen, uh, you know, other individuals that would commit the act of murder while in there, you know, they would either kill their cellmates or somebody on the yard. And, um, that's another, it's like, you know, all you're doing is digging a deeper ditch. You know, if you're already in there for life, whatever possibility you had of getting out, now you're probably going to be sitting on death row somewhere. And is that just, um, would you guess that's just like, impulse of the condition and where somebody came from or is that just like getting in such a hopeless spot it's just like fuck it like i think it's a a mixture it's a combination of both yeah Uh, especially impulse you know you have a lot of people that act on impulse in there um it's when when you when, when you're in a level four institution for example it's like the mass majority of people in there have a life sentence and everybody is so polite. That's one of the big trips. If <laughs> if, you, if you touch that soil, you would trip off how polite everybody is. Hmm. You know, if, if you and I are having a conversation, um, it's so over the top. If, if another individual comes and they need to speak to you, they're going to look at me first. You know, oh, excuse me, Jay, you know. Uh, can I speak with Chad for a minute and, you know, good morning fellas. And it's just, but inside, you know, that, that he's going through it too, just like everybody else is. And you got a lot of people up in there. They're, they're waiting, they're looking for an excuse to hurt somebody. And once somebody messes up, you know, it's so political. It's, it's, it's like, I'll give you a hypothetical scenario, which is something that actually happens a lot of the time. It's, you have territories on a prison yard and uh and it's structured by race yeah if if you uh walk through like like for me i'm I'm puerto rican and hawaiian and you know the samoans puerto rican everybody is over here with the blacks and uh northern hispanics are over here as well over here you'll have white southern hispanics and um uh, 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 like like the Border Brothers from Mexico. That's what they call themselves in there. It's nothing derogatory intended. But if you walk through their area, their table area, and you don't know any better, somebody's going to beat the hell out of you for that. Because that other race is going to raise an issue about it. You know, hey, your people just walked through our area over here and, you know, he disrespected us and it causes an issue. And sometimes it's like, you know, something so minute could cause somebody else from your end to react to you harshly, so violently, where it's like, you know, they, they either cut you, stab you, and it's, you, you you have to adapt to that. You know, if you, if, if you don't adapt to that, you're not going to survive. And, and what's, uh, that, what's, what's that adaptation look like? Like, at, at first, is it like, uh, you got this fear following you around while also having to completely hide that and put your most like strongest foot forward. Um, and then eventually like you just, is it like you get used to that fear to where it's, it's almost like 
not there as much. You're kind of like, I, I, I would I would agree with that for myself. It's like, you know, in general, fear, you know, it, it, it's a primary emotion. Uh, fear is the primary emotion that normally causes anger. Uh, same thing with pain. If you're feeling pain, a lot of the times, especially us as men, um, we get angry when we get when we're hurt. We get angry when we're scared. Right. Um you know, some men will run from it. And in there, it's like when I tell you it's a completely different world, if you cannot survive in the general population in a mainline facility, you are going to end up in a protective custody on a protective custody facility where, you know, you're subjected to a bunch of sex offenders. And it's it's like, you know, who wants to do that? Who wants to go through that? Mm-hmm. Um so, yeah, it's like for me, it was like the fear. I remember going to prison at 18 and thinking, you know, having like a facetious demeanor where everything is funny. I'm not taking this stuff serious and I'm laughing about it. And I'm in the receiving and release complex. So, you know, I go through, you know, do the little mug shot and, you know, receive my uh my, my state ID number and my ID and I go to get housed in one of the cell blocks. I was in North Kern state prison, which is Delano, California. And I remember walking into the cell block. And the first thing I do is I, I, you know, I see a big old buff Mexican dude and, you know, the dude was huge and he's standing there with his shirt off by the fan. Then I look and I see, uh, uh, there, you know, there was a brother there. There was a black dude there, another big old buff dude. And I'm a kid, man. You know, I'm looking at these grown ass men like, oh, man. And then I look at the wall and it says warning, no warning shots fired. And I'm like looking and I'm like, man, what did I get myself into? So you were having you know, a little bit of a like a oh shit moment. You oh, were, yeah. Yeah. Most definitely totally a, like oblivious, like uh, yeah. this is no big deal. Like, yeah. Like how? Yeah. How do you learn? uh like fast track yourself to pick up on the nuances and like, you know, cause obviously you could just go, go in there and accidentally do some yeah. dumb shit that could really have some, some, uh, big consequences. Right. Like, or, definitely or, or people with just mental illness. That's a little like socially. Yeah. Whatever. You know, um, is, there, is there some compassion for that? When people make mistakes, when they're like, oh, so-and-so is a little different or... There is. There is at times. Yeah. Uh, I think it just depends where you're at. And um, it, it, it depends what circle you, you're you part of. Because, I, I mean, it, it, it could be an individual like yourself. If you, anything can happen. You know, anything in life can happen. I've seen... I've I've encountered a lot of people that were incarcerated with me that didn't have any gang ties, didn't know anything about selling any drugs. Um, guys that maybe were drunk behind the wheel and ran somebody over and killed them, you know, a vehicle or manslaughter. And they end up in there with a gazillion years. And, um, it doesn't matter if you're gang affiliated or not. In the state of California, when you hit one of those prison yards, you are going to be affiliated with your race. So as soon as you pull up, somebody is going to approach you, introduce themselves to you, ask you what your name is. Where are you coming from? Uh, do you have your police report uh, uh, or any court paperwork? If you don't, they're going to help you get it. That way they can ensure that you didn't tell on anybody and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And they're going to give you a breakdown, you know, uh, of the guidelines of what the rules are, the unrent rules, so you know, the that, dues. What was your experience in that regard? Uh, I was gang affiliated. So as soon as, you know, I would pull up somewhere, um, there's always dudes from my neighborhood. I'm from Long Beach, California, from L.A. County. And um, I was okay. I was a crip. I was crip would- affiliated. You would personally recognize? No, well, you, you see, so it's it's kind of like if you if you land somewhere, when you get into the cell block, into the housing complex, somebody is going to approach you. 
they're going to approach you and they're, you know, Hey, what's going on, man? I'm so-and-so, uh, you know, with me, a lot of the things I would get a lot of the times is, you know, you know, what are you, what are you Samoan or something? Your people are over there. So it's kind of, you know, you want to check in with your people, mm-hmm. you know, so it, it, it's kind of like, you know, that's, that's what I would experience a lot. And you, so initially off the top, it's like, you know, well, this is who I am. This is where I'm from. And somebody is going to, you know, they're going to, they're, they're going to make sure that you understand, you know, what's going on, what time it is. Not only that, it, it, you are housed with your race or with the circle that you run with from R&R off the top. Um, when you get in, they're going to place you. If, if you're white, you're going to be in the cell with another white. Mm-hmm. And if you're Mexican, the same thing and so on and so on. Um, the, if you don't get it, you know, initially coming through the day room, your cellie, whoever your cellmate is, they're going to make sure that you understand. Because they're responsible for you then, you yeah. know, if, but I've seen a lot of guys that, you know, they're mentally ill. Uh, they used to have a program called Category J. So everybody started um, referring to them as J cats. And, you know, oh, man, that guy's a J cat over there. He's crazy. You know, uh, depending on where you're at, uh, whites and Hispanics, normally they, they would get them guys out of there quick. They would get them up out of there really, really quick. Um blacks and and and, and uh, any other race that you know islanders asians and what they were a little bit more lenient with their people when it came to that you know they would try to do what they can to help them make sure that they were you know seen a therapist they were on medication uh they had the understanding that they were a liability and because you know if somebody does something it's going to set it off you know what i mean if one race has a discrepancy with another race they can't just put their hands on them you know, they have to go about, you know, uh, dealing with the situation politically. They have to follow certain protocols. If if I have an issue with a, a, a Mexican individual, if it's over money, if it's over him saying something that rubbed me the wrong way or something, I'm going to speak with his people, whoever it is that's in charge. And we're going to get down to the bottom of it like that. If we don't reach an understanding, I could tell you right now, it's going to get dark and it's going to get dark quick. And there's going to be a lot of people involved. So the objective for, you know, when it comes to that is trying to avoid that as much as possible. Um, And that's because you got a lot going on. And that's kind of a mutual understanding between people that are more in a place of uh, of power within the group. Yes. Yeah, definitely. It's important to both both yeah groups it's like yo like who wants to have a big yeah dark, dark thing happen when it could be settled or yeah within yeah i mean i mean for me when i got older you know i was one of them individuals you know i had a, i had a program you know i'm i'm working i'm in school uh I, i'm doing good i'm trying to and my whole thing is when it came to the younger dudes from my neighborhood it's like you know man don't don't screw this up you know, don't go and do something stupid, because if you do, you're going to drag everybody into that. And how do you think, you know, individuals are going to feel afterwards? If it's something you can't avoid, it's just unavoidable and you're not in the wrong, then it's completely understandable. But, you know, don't don't mess mine off because, you know, you want to run around, you know, this place and act a fool. But, uh, but there's definitely times people are having to fight get violent whatever it is oh yeah and, and you don't want to it's like yeah you're definitely you definitely have to. yeah and that was a fear of mine especially you know the last handful of years because i was focused on really changing my life you know a lot of dudes just don't want to get into it because you know they're in the visiting room every weekend you know with their woman right. um you know or or you know some guys a lot of guys are selling drugs and if they end up in solitary confinement behind a riot, you know, they're going to lose a lot of money. And it's like, they want to stay focused on whatever it is that they're doing, you know? Uh, But you do have those individuals that don't care and they're just waiting for a reason. You know, they're, 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 they probably got a lot of time or, you know, maybe their girl broke up with them or, 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 you know, this guy over here stared at them, gave them a dirty look or, and they're just waiting. You know, and you got a lot of bitter people, man, a lot of bitter people. And my heart goes out to them. One thing that I learned, because I and, and this this is a this is a beautiful philosophy, you know, at least I believe it is. Um, 
And this helped me really, really adapt in a different way to dealing with people. I accept people for who they are. And I accept people for what they do, whatever, however somebody chooses to live their life. You know, if they're rich, if they're poor, if they're drug users, if they're drug dealers, if, if, if they're completely against drugs, gangs, however you choose to live your life, that's your life. You're entitled to that. I'm not going to judge you. You know, I, I have to focus on me. How can I turn around and judge the next person for how they're choosing to live their life when, you know, I've got my own backyard to clean up? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that's a constant that never stops. You are always trying to do what you can to better yourself and to keep yourself in line, you know, to keep yourself on that path that you're on. And when, when, when I'm able to accept somebody for who they are and how they choose to live their life, that doesn't mean that I have to be around them every day. That doesn't mean that, you know, I, I, I need to uh, um, hang out with them or take on whatever it is that they're doing. It's, you know. I respect you, you know, for who you are as a human being. And as long as whatever it is that the next person is doing doesn't infringe upon my life in an adverse way. Mm -hmm. You know, if that guy wants to go over there and act a damn fool, is it hurting me? That's what I ask myself. And if it's not, I, I got to focus on me and extending my hand to the next individual who wants to take that help. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that just it, it helped me a lot, man, because like I said, initially, I was so focused on what everybody else was doing. You know, I'm I'm sitting up in there, you know, I'm, you know, young, you know, wild. And I'm looking, you know, well, yeah, Joe Blow over here, you know, something's wrong with him. I'm just waiting, you know, for him to do something stupid. And it's like you've got countless individuals that you're watching like that. If you're especially if you're really political up in that place, because it's mm -hmm. like you're waiting for an excuse. And I was I, when I say that, that there's a lot of individuals in there that are waiting, you know, to hurt somebody. They're looking for an excuse to hurt somebody. You know, when I was younger, man, I was one of those individuals. You know, I had a 25 year sentence and uh, I was angry. I was I was pissed. Yeah. And that was that was pretty much the gist of it. I mean, how long did it take you to discover that type of that outlook? of like working with within and and kind of having that epiphany of like you know the only thing you could do is change yourself and then and living in that way then you can only impact the people that you can impact is that like a 12 step thing or was that gradually grow or no nah, the 12 the 12 step thing came a little bit later i i started to recognize that when i actually made it off of a level four, when I made it to a level three institution, I was able to focus on me more. And so in were, the beginning, you were, you were on level four because of your charges. Initially. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then after that, after, so it was because I continued to get in trouble in there. So every time, you know, you, you get in trouble, you're putting your hands on somebody or, you know, if you're you put your hands on on one of the correctional officers or whatever the case may be, your points continue to go up, you know, uh, for any type of serious offense that you commit while you're in there, uh, you're going to be in solitary confinement for a while. I spent some years in and out of solitary confinement. I mean, and how long would that be at a time? Like all different uh, times? It, it depends on the offense. The longest I stood was two years. Oh, so two years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's nothing. You got some guys in there 10, 15, 20 years because they were validated prison gang members. And they finally changed that law like around 2014, where they found it, you know, uh, inhumane. And they started releasing them guys back to the general population if they didn't have any type of prison gang related activity within, uh, uh, you know, the institution. And uh, when I speak on prison gang, it's like, uh, and I know, you know, a lot of people have heard of like the Mexican mafia or the black gorilla family or uh, uh, Aryan brotherhood. And, you know, so individuals of that caliber, you know, and um, I think it was actually better when they started releasing them guys from solitary confinement 
uh, that were in there on an indeterminate basis because uh, every time I would go to solitary confinement, you know, you don't have that interaction with everybody like you do on a regular yard, but you still have interaction. You speak to your neighbors, you know, through the vent system. Uh, when you do go out to the yard, if even if you're in a walk alone cage, there's a cage next to you. And, you know, people are, you know, handing you literature that, you know, you need to read. And they're basically trying to teach you uh, more about unity. And and it's sad because there's a huge us against them mentality and them being the cops, you know, uh, law enforcement. And um, I mean, it's it's kind of common sense. If everybody worked together, both sides, you know, life would be a lot better. And, you know, people would actually come out uh, on the higher end rehabilitated. But, you know, I mean, it's capitalism man. you know, people are making their money and. You know, the more prisoners they got, you know, generated through them places, the more money they generate as well. You know, it's it's all revenue. But yeah, so uh, um, what solitary? I, I don't mean to be so. I don't mean to be so cliche. Um, but like, can you say a little word about solitary confinement? Like, like, is it explainable? Can you explain what it what it's like to be a human in that? in that way or like is it just so shocking at first or does it have waves and and how do you find how do you find any sense of like hope or a golden nugget just to focus on i mean i guess i can only relate to myself like when i if i'm in a shitty scenario which is nothing in comparison but if you can find something that's like i'm working on this then a lot of other things can fall to the side of, I guess I'm saying some kind of target or direct. Yeah. Um, man, I, I, I've known a lot of individuals that have lost their minds sitting in a prison cell, uh, 23 hours a day. You know, some, I, I've been in situations where you're in there 23 and one, one day, and then 24 hours straight through the next day. And then you'll go out to the yard for an hour every other day. It just depends where you're at. Um, you have like the main security housing units, like they have a, a shoe in Pelican Bay and Corcoran into Hatchapi, uh, New Folsom. There, you know, so um, but just administrative segregation, period. Uh in in the shoe, when you're in an actual shoe facility, a security housing unit facility, you in order to get there, you have to go through administrative segregation first. If you make it to a shoe facility, it's really going to be based on how long your solitary confinement stay is going to be. So uh, initially, if you had six months or more to serve in solitary confinement, you would be transferred to a security housing unit and they give you a TV there. You know, you if you have a TV in your property, you get it or you can order one. So, you know, that kind of keeps guys, you know, focused on something else well up in there. Uh, administrative segregation, you know, at the times when I was going through ad seg, there there was nothing, you know. So um, for me, um, what do you mean by nothing? It, like, you don't get a TV. There was no television. There was no radio. Uh, you could get books. You know, you would be able to get books. And that was like a big thing for me. You know, I've read so many books, man. I can't even begin to tell you. I can't even imagine how many. I've probably read about a thousand books in my lifetime. And um, that was a good focus for me. You know, you even just novels, you learn so much because these authors, they piece everything together. It's like evidence based even for something that's fictitious, you know, so, or, or fictitious, it's, it's like just being able to kind of get lost in the world of whatever story it is that you're right. reading, yeah. you know? Um, but after so long, as I had got a little bit older, it was like, I didn't want to read anything that was fictitious anymore. I really focused more on textbook learning. Yeah. You're wanting you know, to learn. I wanted, yeah, I wanted, yeah, I wanted to really be able to acquire some type of skills, some type of, you know, tools that I needed to be able to deal with people a lot better because I knew that eventually I would make it out of there. And when I did, I wanted to be at least semi prepared for for the adjustment period, because a huge part of being able to adjust back to society 
is being able to communicate with people. And one thing that I can say is, um, man, I'm, I'm thankful that I didn't lose my mind while I was up in there completely. And I'm fully aware that every single time that I was released from solitary confinement, that it took a toll on me mentally where it was harder and harder for me to communicate with the next person. Hmm. And it, it, that was a huge adjustment period, can especially little, coming home. Can you say a little bit more about that? Like what, what was hard? Um, when you're accustomed to being by yourself and if you like, okay, if I'm, if this is a cell and I'm sitting in this cell and I'm in here by myself alone, and you're in the cell next door, there's a vent system that's there. Now, I might go over there and talk to you through the vent. We might have a conversation through the vent. At no time at all, none whatsoever, are you and I going to physically encounter each other and hang out. It's not going to happen. When we go to yard, I'm going to be in a cage, and you might be in the cage next to me. You know, we have two hours, whatever, there, or, or an hour, depending on where you're at. Some places will give you an hour. If it's an hour a day, some will give you two hours if it's every other day. So it's how like you want to get your ex- How important is that that uh, yard time? Uh, it's, it's vital. It's vital. You know, uh, for me, it was. That was, you know, me, me being able to get out of that concrete cell, being able to go and exercise. Um, and just, you know, get that that fresh air, man. It was just, you know, it, it was like something that my lungs were just, you know, dying for. Mm. Uh, being able to see that sun, you know, and uh, yeah, it's just like, you know, you want to be able to get that moment to yourself. You might have a conversation with the next man briefly for, you know, 15, 20 minutes or whatnot. But, you know, it's going to be, oh, okay, you know, well, hey, man, I'll catch up with you in a minute. And you're going to go and do your exercise. You're going to walk around that little cage and you're just going to take in every piece of, you know, life that you can within those moments, man. And would it feel um, like, would it feel like the time to just go so fast at that time? Oh, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Most definitely. Um, and everywhere. And in any time you leave that cell, when you're in solitary confinement, you are cuffed behind your back there, you know, um, a lot, if you're leaving the action, say that again. (laughs) Anytime you leave that cell, you're cuffed behind your back. Okay. Yeah. You know, so there's there's a tray slot. If you're going to the yard, if you're going to the shower, they're going to open that tray slot. You're going to turn around, stick them hands behind your back. They're going to cuff you up after you're stripped naked. And they're going to take you to the shower in your boxers. Lock you in the shower, uncuff you. You know, no matter where you're going, you know, you're going to be cuffed at all times. Um, If you're leaving the actual unit, if you, you know, they're, they're going to, they're going to leg shackle you. And that was like a huge thing too. It's like that for me, just, I never got used to that. That was like a big thing. And anytime I would end up in solitary confinement, I'm like, oh my God, man. You know, my wife having to come see me behind glass. It's like, you know what I mean? I'm cuffed getting escorted through a visiting room with everybody out here, you know, looking at you, you know, in a jumpsuit, chained up. If you're not just cuffed going to visit, you're chained up, you know, and you're placed inside of a a little box, a little box room and the other individuals across from you, you know, Uh, some places don't even unchain you. They leave you chained up the whole time while you're in there. And, you know, that's the last thing that you want. You want your family to see you like that, man. But um every time i was released from solitary confinement it was just a struggle being able to interact with everybody because when you're released back into the general population it's like you're living you're going to get a job assignment or education assignment um yard opens up you're going to be out there on the yard guys are playing basketball exercising talking to each other playing chess pinochle whatever you know what have you not And it's like everybody is out there, you know, for X amount of hours a day living their lives. And here you are kind of like, damn, man, you know, I'm I'm coming from being in that box 
you know, 23, 24 hours a day to this. Like, how do I deal with this now? Because I've become accustomed to that. And this is starting to bother me. And, you know, you, I mean, some guys get a sense of uh, that, that, you know, that, that safety net up in there when they're in solitary confinement as well, because they don't have to worry about a riot popping off. You know, then, you know, you know, that's, I wouldn't think about that. So you're just, <clears throat> that's what I'm trying to wonder about, like these different ways that your body is adapting, your mind is adapting in a different way. And I never would have thought about that. Like, actually, yeah. you feel there might be a sense of more safety, like a trade off. Um, so is it pros and cons? Yeah, you, you mentioned like you're never going to be like uh feel somebody's energy to energy inter interact hang with somebody like you said um why is that important like is it is it that you just get comfortable not doing that so therefore when you're when you're put back into normal uh society, prison society then it's just like you you have discomfort or is it like anger or is it can you explain it? Elaborate on that a little bit for me. I just, uh, when you mentioned um, it being hard each time that you feel like you lost something mentally and then what, I just want to know more about that. Like, like what is being in that solitary confinement? Uh, like what I, see, you, I see what you're saying. Yeah, what are you losing? And then how do you... What's it feel like that first time when you're back and you're trying to like, like, what's the difference? What's the discomfort? Is it anger? Is it just confusion? Is it your, can you explain it? I, it it's hard. That's why I, I, I get what you're saying. And that's why you were asking earlier, you know, can you explain, you know, about solitary confinement in that sense? Um, like I just said, there, you know, it's pros and cons. Mm hmm for an individual that actually, you know, feels safer because maybe they just went through a, a, a riot, you know, um, them riots get nasty. I've seen them where, you know, you might have seven, 10 individuals involved. To, I've seen them where there's a couple hundred inv individuals involved out there fighting, uh, people getting stabbed and, you know, and, uh, I've seen, you know, the, 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 the guard, you know, the, the correction officer in the tower literally blow somebody's brains out. Because they're they're in there with you know they've got the mini fourteens up there, and if they spot somebody that's stabbing somebody else, you know, it's lethal, man. You know, nine times out of ten, they're going to try to kill that person. Yeah, and I've seen that on you know on a number of occasions, uh, you know, a few occasions. So it's when you in, in when you go into solitary confinement, normally you're going in there after experiencing a tra a traumatic experience. You know, whether if it's you've battered somebody or you've assaulted somebody with a weapon or a riot, whatever the case may be, nine times out of 10, if you're not in there on an indeterminate shoe term, uh, you're going in there because an incident happened, an incident occurred, and you're going to basically serve your time in the jail within the prison. So when you, when an individual gets in there, I would say that, at least for me, it's like you do get that sense of safety. But you don't realize what the place is doing to your mind in the meantime. Mm. It's it's causing you to become even more antisocial. Mm -hmm. So if 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 you're locked up in a room, you know, for a year or two where the social factor is at a very minimum, and then you're placed in an environment where there's a thousand people in the vicinity, it's 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 like you know, how do you deal with that? How do you adjust back? And, you know, even even if you're able to uh, articulate yourself, you, you know, you got some real charismatic people up in there that, but still at the same time, it's like me. It's like, I might be able to smile and, you know, man, how's it going? And But in here, it's kind of like, Pop, man, I, I need to get the hell away from here. Yeah. I can't wait to yard closes so I could go back to the cell. Right. You know, um, if you're in a place where yard is not mandatory for you to attend, for you to go out to, then it's like you're probably going to be in that cell for a while. And you got certain individuals knocking on the door. You all right, man? Everything good? You know, you want to come out to the yard, bro? 
And it's like some guys will push that line for you to be out there on that yard in case something happens because you are an asset to your circle. In case something happens, you're able to help, you know, defend the guys within your circle. And it's like, it's, it's hard to deal with that, man. Um, even, you know, if you don't mind too, I'll speak on the adjustment period from coming home. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's, it was, it was bad, man. I was convinced by the time, you know, me, I was paroling from a level three institution. Um, I, I had obtained, I earned a college education. Uh, I was doing great, man. I was doing better than I had ever done in prison before. Um, unfortunately, where I was housed at in the general population, I was single cell status for, uh, and that's just how that prison was structured. Everybody was living in the cell alone. Um, for, I want to say almost five years, I lived by myself. Hmm. Uh, and you know, but I'm out and about throughout the day working and, you know, running my program. Like you, can you, can you leave and go as you please? Or it's like, everybody's got a routine of like, okay, now this certain amount of time. You're no. Left. Okay. Where, where I have parole from, you know, most people are working, not, not everybody, but most guys are working throughout the day or they're in school or something, but no, you were able to go and, you know, they have unlocks, you know, on the hourly usually, you and know, you so to, if it's, you get to choose like what you want to do, like program work. Yeah. For the most part, I mean, you're going to, if you get a job in the kitchen, if they send you a job assignment, Ducket, and it's for the kitchen, you could job change up out of there. You could go and look for something else that you're more interested in. Talk to whoever it is, you know, whatever supervisor runs that area and, you know, if they take to you, if they agree, you know, I'm gonna give you a chance or whatnot, then, you know, they'll sign off and they'll transfer you over your your work, you know, to wherever it is. So if you work in the kitchen and, you know, say you have clerical skills and you want to work in the law library, they'll, you know, go ahead and transfer your job assignment over to the law library. Okay. Um, if they have space in there, if not, you got to keep on checking, you know, and, you know, kind of sell yourself. The bad thing is it's like, you know, when they talk about modern day slavery, this is a big thing that's starting to pick up throughout the nation right now with prison wages. You know, guys are working legit jobs, but some of them are getting paid eight cents an hour, 10 cents an hour, you know, 24 cents an hour. Some are getting paid zero. And it's like that kind of breaks the incentive for somebody to actually want to work and do good while they're up in there. And um, so a lot of people are trying to change that right now where, you know, guys will actually earn some type of wage. There is some programs where they'll earn like a dollar an hour. Um, it, it, it just, it varies, you know, where, where you're at and what's available to you. But yeah, you know, I was able to, you know, pretty much go like if it's 9 a.m. and they'll open, they'll open the housing unit, they'll open the cell block for guys to go out. You know, you go to the yard, work, wherever you're going, 8 a.m. and then 10 a.m., they'll have another unlock. They'll lock the building after like 10 minutes. And so it's like that throughout the day until count time. And um, so for me, you know, I, I had it. I was convinced that I was fully intact, that there was nothing wrong with me. I was great. Uh, you know, you, I, you, I, saw, you saw it coming. You're counting down the months, the days, and you're like, okay, yes, cool. yeah, definitely. And, and did you ever think consciously, you know, like, am I going to be all right? Or, or, is um, it, or where, yeah, where you... peri per periodically, but I was so well adapted to being able to deal with people. I was helping a lot of people in there. And like I had mentioned previously, you know, earlier on that I, I was facilitating you know, different types of self-help groups, you know, one of them being for incarcerated fathers. Yeah. And, you know, I would get up, you know, on a podium and speak in front of hundreds of people. Um, Man, I, I was doing good. I was, I was a clerk for the college program during the day where I would tutor a lot of guys. I would help individuals with their FAFSA paperwork and, you know, get them financial aid and whatnot yeah. in there. And, um, I was, I was doing great. And I just had it in my head when it was time to come home, I'm fine. Well, you know, sense. I'm in good health. I'm in good shape. I'm, you know, I got an education. Um, I'm able to, you know, converse with people yeah. and, and, you know, be able to uh, be genuine about who I am with people and extend that hand to them. 
when I came home, it was a completely different story, man. It was, it, it was an adjustment. I remember going to Outback when I first got out and uh, somebody dropped something, a fork or something. And, and, and I jumped. Uh, I remember the feeling of having a metal fork in my mouth for the first time in over two decades, how uncomfortable it felt. Oh, shit. Um, I remember the feeling of people walking behind me while I'm at a restaurant sitting there and continuously looking over my shoulder. Um, waking up in the middle of the night to any type of movement or noise. And it, it, it's like, even to this day, I've been home for two years now. And even to this day, it's like sometimes I find myself where it's like I am not complete i haven't completely adjusted and uh it made me realize just how much that place took a toll on me you know mentally so for so 14 15 years is that last stint with how long you were in no 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 the last stint i was gone for over 20 years oh shit yeah yeah so in 1998 i did um, 14 months off of two years. I came home in 99, like toward the end of 99. The In 2000, I ended up going back and I did not come home until the end of 2020. Hmm. Man. Yeah. I, you, you've been through, through some shit, man. Some real, like, uh, a real journey. I know we couldn't even possibly touch on all of it today. I mean, I just, I really appreciate your openness and, and, you know, we, we, we don't know each other other than yeah. interacting some, but I, I really appreciate your openness and, and your ability to, to capture and try to explain it the the best you can. Um, so, one thing I was thinking about is like, well, I mean, how how do you st- how do you keep going on the path that you're on? Like, like I know it's just since we had the twelve step thing in in common. I know when you give, uh, that gives you something back when you of keep course. working and you keep building and impacting other people's life is one of the most. Um, yeah, just motivating, uh, good feeling things, whatever, whatever you, you, you want to call that. Um, yeah. I mean, how, how hard is it, uh, to not come out and, and, uh, self-medicate or, uh, you know, just, I don't know, keep, keep on the path that you're on. For me, um, I, I've never, I was never a big drug user. I tried things when I was younger and, you know, thankfully I didn't have that addictive personality. Alcohol was another story. Um, alcohol was a problem for me. I was drinking while I was in there, you know, guys. You gotta, uh, do you gotta like sneak it and stuff or? Like- no, no. Well, yeah, you gotta be careful that they don't catch you, but guys, you know, they, they, they make wine, they call it Pruno, yeah. you know, so you get your, you ferment your fruit and. You know, you, you you cook your batch and, you know, some guys go as far as they'll throw a hot water stinger in that wine and they separate the uh, the liquor out of the wine. And you've, you know, you got some pure moonshine right there. Mm-hmm. And um, I would go off and on. I would drink for some years and then stop for some years. And, you, you know, mind you, this is, you know, two decades of going through this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, even AA is 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 a whole nother story how I got involved. I had a cousin that was in prison with me, but he was in a, on another yard. And we used to go to the AA meetings to meet up. And um, I was drinking at the time. And I was telling him, like, you know, I don't want to keep on coming to these meetings, man. I'm starting to feel a little hypocritical, you know, because I'm coming over here just to meet you. So we need to figure out something else because I'm not at a point where I need to stop, where I want to stop drinking rather. I'm not there right now. Were you picking up on some of the, a lot of 
the content with uh definitely step stuff is just definitely like you're there drinking or whatever it, but the main thing was just to hang with your cousin is that why you yeah were- yeah yeah because we were on different yards we were residing on different yards from each other so yeah that was a a, a, a neutral place where we were able to meet up at and it was every friday and um, I had told him, you know, when I told him I was done, he said, man, just, just come one more week next week to meet me. And, you know, and he was a kid when I left, you know, his brother, which is uh, my, my cousin as well. This is my uncle's son. He was murdered while I was in prison. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when my little cousin Mike ran into me in there, it was like, he immediately ended up in tears and, you know, we just wanted to be able to spend some type of time with each other when we could. Yeah. But he was like, just come next Friday one more time and then we'll figure it out what we're going to do after that. You know, he was like, I just I need to see you until I go home. So I'm like, OK, so the next Friday where I went, there was a good friend of me. He's a good friend of mine now named Patrick Guthrie. And uh, I think Patrick has oh, excuse me. I think he's at like 31 years sober. Um, So. uh, uh he usually, you know, he was a clown. He would get up there at the podium and speak. And when he would, you know, share, everything was, you know, he was he was joking a lot. You know what I mean? He'd touch on his points, but he was there to make everybody laugh. Well, this individual ended up sharing uh, uh, basically a, a good portion of his life story about what he went through growing up in his household with his dad and, you know, his mom and him and his sister, what they dealt with. And by the end of his share, man, I was sitting there in tears Mm. and I was like, I need to stop drinking. And I just, I never, I never left it alone. I just kept on going. And, um, as soon as I came home, man, that, you know, the herd, they were there for me. You know, they they started coming to see me, picking me up. Um, I mean, the computer that I'm on, uh, Patrick's daughter, who, you know, God rest her soul, she just passed away. Um, and she was only 20 years old. This computer that I'm on right now was a gift from them. She came all the way out here to drop this off to me. You know, so it's like that's how tied in I was. You know, I was doing a lot of volunteer work through uh, the Santa Barbara office with a gentleman, uh, a good friend of mine, Tim Wickham. And... Yeah, man. So uh, that, you know, has been a big blessing. So that night, uh, and this relates to this, you know, this passion I have about empathy, which is nothing complicated. (laughs) You already know. Yeah. yeah. The willingness to hear somebody else and and, uh, imagine what it might be like, you know, to be them or whatever it is. Um, But he one thing I like what's motivating me about this is like um, I've experienced that time hearing somebody share. And what about that brought tears to your eyes is that you could like relate to it. Like, so Um, like it just, I I couldn't, I couldn't relate to it. He had been in and out of the County jail for years when he was younger, when he was not sober, when he was drinking and using drugs, Uh, he was strung out off heroin real bad, but his childhood was a lot worse than mine and i grew up poor and he didn't it was just the things that he dealt with as a kid that his father was doing to him and his sister um i i couldn't believe it it literally made me realize that somebody doesn't have to be in prison or grow up poor you know, to, 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 to get the hard end of the stick, man. Mm. And that right there really, I mean, when it comes to empathy, I think for me, that was like a life changing moment where I was able to seriously empathize with the next person. And it wasn't because, you know, empathy is really based on uh, uh, me or you being able to try to put ourselves in the next person's shoes, like you said, and, you know, try to imagine what that's like and feel for them. Um, I couldn't do that. What he shared with, with, and he shared this with about 200 people in that room. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I couldn't imagine what that was like. And that just made me empathize with that man even more. And, um, uh, like even right now, man, his daughter was killed in a car accident, you know, a few weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, you know, like, my God, I couldn't imagine that. You know, I I, I have 
you know, kids, they're grown, they're adults, but I've got kids and it's, you know, my heart goes out to him and his wife, man. So, uh, yeah, Patrick Guthrie, he was the one, man. He just, he really woke me up, you know, just with what he shared. And it just made me realize a whole lot. And was he somebody in prison or somebody just coming in to speak? No, he was, he was someone coming in to speak, coming in to share. So every Friday, um, a different crew would come in and, you know, you get familiar with these people. I was actually on the committee. I was uh, the Sergeant of arms for, for Alcoholics Anonymous in the prison where I was and the prison where I was, we ran a big one. Uh, It it was a really, really big AA uh, group that we had. We had four different groups, one for each Friday. And I engaged in every single group every Friday because I was part of that executive committee. Um, and like Tim Wickham is, is huge. You know, he's, he's really, really big in California. He's known, you know, all over. And like I said, I had got so tied into it when I came home, you know, um, immediately, you know, I got a sponsor and, you know, everybody was just there for me, just, you know, to try to ensure that I did not drink and, uh, yeah, man, you know, it's, it's, I'm blessed. It it really is a true blessing. Yeah. So in a way, this dude would come in to speak. He was kind of funny cracking jokes and stuff, but this one in particular time, it, uh, it hits you in a way that like, although it was cool, people coming from the outside in and, and serve and, and given, given service, there's, there's still, I'm hearing like there's still a little bit of a gap like, yeah, but you're not like me and you haven't been through what I've been through. But then that kind of broke that down in you. Exactly. And not only are you guys not alike, he he went through something that you could, it was hard to even imagine putting yourself yeah. in shoes. Exactly. In a, exactly. In a way, what I'm hearing from you is like you're able to, by experience, uh, just see people for for people and it's yeah. kind of like a humility thing like you exactly you know, you that's know exactly what it, it is you know how bad it can get for not only yourself but others and you just yeah. know people's story and uh you know I, there are some people that don't they don't understand the empathy thing or or what would yeah. be what would be even the point and like one of my biggest things is like well if you get along with somebody <laughs> And you agree, you know, you're from the same kind of uh, experience and stuff. It, it's kind of easy to empathize with somebody of that, course. that you're a lot like. And yeah. that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking yeah. about why would we want to empathize with somebody that maybe we see things like way different or yeah. like enemies? Like what? what is the point? Why would I do that? And I've been thinking about that for myself, too. and. And do you have anything to say on that? Like, why why would you want to empathize with somebody that's maybe did something unforgivable or that's really hard? Like, what what would be the point? For me, um, like a pet peeve that I have is, you know, uh, individuals that hurt children mm-hmm. um, and women. And uh, I can't even begin to tell you uh, how many of those type of individuals I have literally chased off prison yards. That was a huge pet peeve for me. And it's a huge pet peeve for a lot of men in there. Um, I can't say that I am at a point where I'm completely empathetic or empathic towards somebody of that caliber. Yeah. But I finally had to reach a point to where, uh, For myself and for the next individual, no matter who it is, I had to be able to stop focusing on what the next person was doing or what they've done. And whatever somebody else does, you and I are not responsible for it. Unless it's your child, you know, and they're a minor. It's like we as humans tend to focus on the next person more than ourselves at times. And it takes away from us 
being able to better ourselves. So it, even if I don't have a strong sense of empathy for somebody else, the key word that you mentioned a moment ago was humility. Mm -hmm. For me to be able to humble myself to say, you know what, that's that person's life. And however that individual chooses to live their life, that's on them. Yeah. You know, I am not responsible for that. I'm responsible for me and whatever it is that they're going through. If they have some type of a mental illness or whatever the case is, you know, that that's that's their karma to deal with. Yeah, I, I think about like uh, well, kind of what I'm hearing you say, and you can let me know if you resonate with this or not of of like it's not like I'm out here thinking that the goal is. uh to completely empathize with anyone, especially yeah. in, in a scenario you're talking about. Like, I like, I like how you said, like, yeah, I'm not saying I'm at that place and that's totally fine, but just the willingness to have, uh, the consciousness to, to think about that and just to be like, Oh, could, I, could, uh, the willingness to empathize is almost yeah. just as powerful as empathizing that you you have willingness to, to, and for me, it almost can be like a 12 step thing where, where it can almost be a selfish thing in a positive way that like, yeah. uh, whenever you're willing to do some of that work, like really it's it, when you're talking about worrying about everybody else, like when you worry about everyone else and, and tit for tat everything, and you should, uh, know, it's like, it weighs on your shoulders definitely, and your hatred whatever you call that, just the, it's not good for you. And, no, most definitely. And, and it deteriorates. This is kind of the narrative that drives me. It like deteriorates your ability to impact, to impact people. Yeah. Basically. It's like you're yeah. frozen in the nothingness and the addicted to so-and-so is doing and blah, blah, blah. And that, and that don't mean that you're, that it's not going to get blurred lines and, and that's yeah. going to happen. Of course it's going to happen. Yeah. Like, um, but for me of what it drives me is like when I'm willing to, to work that muscle, if we call empathy, that muscle, it's not, it's not like you ever, it's like the sobriety stuff. It's not like you just get good at it. And then like yeah. oh, on to the next goal, it's like this repetition of just maintenance and uh and growing that part inside of me and also knowing that like yo like if a situation's so dangerous there's no time for it yeah necessarily yeah and that's gonna happen too there's imperfect i mean life is just it's crazy uh yeah i had, I had a question on here of just randomly i thought of some stuff i might ask you and and uh well, let me wait on that. I just want to see if you had anything to reflect on what I, what I just said. If if uh, my sense is that you resonated with at least some of it. No, ab absolutely, ab absolutely. You know, um, I I, ha I just I have a different focus now, and like I had mentioned, you know, before, it's like I'm not so focused on what the next individual goes on. I am a firm believer in be good to yourself. When you're good to yourself, then you're able to be good to other people. Be good to yourself and be good to those who are good to you. Um, like if I could touch on something for a brief moment here, because you asked uh, basically how was I able to overcome that lifestyle? How am I able to maintain you know, traveling down the path, down the road that I'm traveling down. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I grew up poor, man. I grew up in a poverty stricken environment, you know, between Long Beach and Compton. And uh, we used to travel back east sometime to Brooklyn, you know, um, but mostly out in LA. And I remember, you know, my dad leaving when I was four. I remember being homeless, you know, in and out of homeless shelters with my mom, sleeping on a bus bench, uh, uh, waiting for her friend to come home or actually on the bus when she didn't know where to go. Then we ended up going sleeping in the laundromat to an apartment complex because her friend wasn't home. Just, you know, I, I went through the ringer, you know. Um, I see a bigger picture. Uh, a lot of people like, like, like I ended up realizing that in prison, for example, you've got 
prison politics that everybody focuses on so strongly in in in, in a poverty stricken environment in the in the hood. You got individuals that are focused on them turf politics. Mm -hmm. And it's like, for me, I I was able to wake up and realize, you know, that's not the real politics. Mm -hmm. The political system is actually based upon these environments being here so people could capitalize off of them. If you know that people are committing crimes here and they're going to go through this cycle of being walk through a prison system like cattle, you got people that are making a lot of money off of that. And that's where you are dealing with the politicians. You're, you know, you're dealing with the governors, you're dealing with, um, you know, mayors, senators, and, and, and it, and it trickles down all the way down to, you know, a, a, co- a correctional officer, you know, it's job security for the next person. Mm -hmm. So earlier I mentioned like the us against them mentality. So that right there, it's like people don't even realize if you got a fresh correction officer that's coming into the system, it's like, I I, I know that he's going to be corrupted nine times out of 10, unless he's strong enough to be one of the individuals that tries to make a difference Mm -hmm. that he goes in there and he does his eight hours productively instead of hanging over here with the crowd of the rest of them, like they're gang members. Mm-hmm. Staring at all the prisoners on the yard. That's politics. Mm-hmm. All the gang crap and all that shit, that, that's not politics, man. They want you to think that that's politics and they want you to feed into that. And they don't even realize that that's what they want because it's the guys in the suit and ties, you know, that are pushing harder and harder to be tougher on crime instead of trying to find a way, you know, to to reduce it, to reduce that recidivism rate. And I don't want to be up under that anymore. I don't want to be another statistic that comes up out of my neighborhood where I'm dead or spending the rest of my life in prison. And that helps me to empathize with the next individual that grew up the way that I did, because it's easy for me to empathize with somebody, you know, like Patrick. Even though I might not be able to fathom or grasp what he went through, the concept of actually feeling that, you know, in here, I feel it. But up here, I could never imagine that. But I could still empathize with him. I could empathize, you know, with the average individual society. But somebody, you know, that that grew up the way I did, you know, from that that's cut from that cloth. You know, usually we look at each other like we're enemies. But now I see it, it's like, you know, even though you know better, ironically, you don't know any better. Hmm. You know, you grew up in this environment where the system is designed for you to fail. And, you know, a few, there are some that actually overcome that. But for the most part, statistically, people that grow up in those type of environments, they end up where I was at, you know, for the past 20 years. And uh, now it's like, Now that I realize that that's what it is, that that's exactly what I had been striving to live for and fight for my entire life, because I grew up around nothing but gangbangers, man, Mm -hmm. nothing but drug dealers, pimps, hustlers. That's that's it. It's like now I understand that, you know, okay, they've got a place for all of us. And, you know, the government is going to capitalize on us if they can. And, And they do and they will. And I want to be able to show the next individual who wants to change, who wants to do something productive for their their son, their daughter, or their mom, or themselves, that this is what it is. And you do not have to be another statistic that falls under that same umbrella, because that cloud that's above that umbrella is dark and it's pouring, man. It's an ugly storm that we walk through. Yeah. And that keeps me going, man. That lets me know that, uh, again, not only do I not want that lifestyle for my son, and if I don't want it for him, then why in the hell do I want it for myself? Because I know what it entails. I know I can see the bigger picture. Yeah. How do you, and I'm putting myself 
in there is if I was you or something like how do you how do you deal with um how uh I'm trying to put it in the words here of like when you're when you're here and you're on this other path of ex, of of impacting these people that was grew up in that way that you did and you're kind of on a mission to yeah to impact them and connect with them in a way like how do you take on um you know do you ever get hopeless like man how would i how would I, how would i help as many people as that's in my heart i would really want to or do you ever connect with someone and you can share stories, whatever, and empathize with them. But at the same time, you can tell it's like the 12 step thing. You can tell they're not there and you wish you could turn that switch on for them of, of just this awareness. And it's like, does that make sense? Oh yeah. All I can do is try. Um, when I like, like for, for instance, when I go to an AA meeting, um, I sit there and I let a good handful of people share, you know, and I'm usually one of the last ones to share. And one of the things that, especially where, you know, I, and I go to different meetings. I don't just go to my home base meeting. I go to different meetings in different counties. Um, right now I've been a little bogged down with work. But when I do attend meetings, I usually go to meetings where people are just being introduced to me and I'll listen to everybody, you know, what they have to say, you know, I'll take their share in. Mm -hmm. My objective is when I share is to have the next person look at me and take in everything that I just shared. And say, fuck, I'm glad I didn't go through that. I know I got my problems and I know I'm dealing with this, that, and the other. But I would never want to go through that. Hmm. And usually, I, I get that. I get that response from a lot of people. You know, you could see it in their face. You see it at the end of the meetings when they're walking up to you to, you know, to shake your hand and, you know, like... You know, uh, uh, introducing themselves and, you know, telling you, you know, that, uh, you know, they, they appreciate you. And, and it, it's just it's huge for me mm -hmm. to be able to get that type of response from people, because I know in my mind that maybe this is what they need. To wake up and understand that it, this can happen to anybody, because like I told you before, Everybody in there isn't gang affiliated. The mass majority is, especially out here in California. But you do have, you know, a, a, a good handful of individuals that things just turned out negative for them, man. You know, and a lot of times alcohol or drugs or both play a part in that. Yeah. You know, I've seen doctors in there, attorneys, you know, anything can happen. I, I've, I've seen it, man, literally, you know, I've seen people in there with, with, with like, like I said, with, with the MD degree, uh, uh, with, with, with the PhD and it's like, damn, you know, how, what, what the hell are you doing in here? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's one of the things that I share too. And it's like, if you know yourself as an individual, and you know how you get when you're drinking, then you need to ask yourself, do I really need to be drinking? Should I be drinking? And if you're somebody that knows that you shouldn't be drinking, the rest is on you. Mm -hmm. You know, the rest is on you. How much are you going to put into this? How much effort are you going to put into this? How much are you going to understand that nobody on earth is capable or more capable of taking care of you than you are yourself unless you know unless you're disabled mm -hmm. if you're capable I mean, you can overcome I, I mean if somebody like me did you know and I, I think i started drinking when i was like 12 man i think i was like 10 the first time i tasted it but you know i started drinking when i was like 12 and you know, alcohol was a huge thing for me, big time. 
you know, and it's the same thing for, you know, avid drug users, people that, you know, they get high. It's the same thing. It's like, you know, it's what do you want for yourself? Yeah. And if, if an individual wants that help, my hand is there. If they want to take it, I, I can't force them to, but if they want to, you know, I'll share a piece of my journey with them and hope that they get something from that. And they're able to, to empathize with that. Yeah. Do you, do you, uh, do you get down currently? Do you have waves of ups and downs? What do you mean? As far as like just inside your own mind, you mean like depression? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, my son is in prison and he doesn't come home until, uh, 2033. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, like I mentioned at the beginning, you know, of your podcast where uh, a, a good friend of mine, a childhood friend of mine, you know, he's been incarcerated since he was 16. He's 44. And he doesn't go to a parole board. You know, he's trying to see if he could get, you know, his case overturned and appeal to the court to see if they'll let him out because they're trying to do away with the juvenile LWAPs. And he spent 17 years in and out of solitary confinement. And, you know, it's like when I, you know, and I communicate with him every day, you know, him and my son. And, um, yeah, I have those moments, you know, I have those moments where I sit back and I reflect on, uh, what I've been through, mm. you know, and I mean, I take accountability, responsibility for what I did. Didn't nobody force me to pull that trigger. Mm -hmm. You know, I was angry and uh, there was a lot going on in my neighborhood and I chose to do that. But at the same time, it's like, like I mentioned, you know, that's an environment where there's a system that's designed for people to fail. And, you know, I, I fell victim to that. You know, I was subjected to a certain type of lifestyle and behavior from a very, very early age, you know, where family members of mine, you know, we're in that lifestyle mm -hmm. and it's like uh an analogy that i use is if you have a group of individuals in one circle that eat nothing but oranges and then there's a bigger outer circle around them where that group of individuals they consume nothing but apples and it's illegal in life period to consume oranges that inner circle that where, where they eat oranges more than anything, they're going to continue eating their oranges and they're going to say the hell to the hell with, you know, what they're talking about. This is how we grew up and this is what it is. I don't care if it's against the law or not. Yeah. And when you're subjected to that type of behavior, it's like, it's, it's very few break away from that circle and, you know, fall in compliance or conform, you know, to with what the law stipulates or what the outer, the bigger circle, you know, implements in life. So it's like, yeah, man, I have those moments. I definitely have those moments. Yeah. Um, you said you talk to your, your son and, uh, your childhood friend every day, like on. Yeah. The yeah. Yeah. My son, they call. Yeah. They call on a consistent basis. Um, uh, you know, they, they, they now, you know, a lot of guys smuggle in cell phones. I, that was another hard habit for me to kick the last four years. I went without having a cell phone in there. And the reason being too, is when you get caught with them, you get 90 days added to your time. Each time you get caught with a cell phone in there and you don't get the time back. Um, you know, my boy has life without the possibility of parole. You know, if he gets caught with a phone, uh, not not my son, you know, my homeboy, my friend, um, if he gets caught with a phone, it's like he'll get another one. So, you know, it's like, what are they going to do to him? You know, that's the demeanor. But I commend him. You know, he's he's, you know, in the music industry. Uh, he's authored different novels, including children's books. He's earned multiple degrees. You know, he's 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 done a lot. He's made a lot of changes, you know. Um, my son is working on it as well. You know, he's in college. He's involved in a lot of self-help groups up in there. And, you know, he's trying to maintain to the best of his ability. So how, how old is your son right now again? 23. What's what's his like spirit and demeanor like when you talk to him? 
Um, it varies, you know, uh, he has those moments where he's really down and I get it, you know, I've been there, I know what it's like. And then he has those moments where, you know, he's, he's just got this, uh, uh, happy go lucky personality. And I love it. I love being able to hear him like that. You know, um, is that, is he just, that like when he's like, he just like fired up about like what he's doing, where he's going. Yeah. Yeah. It just depends on what's going on. You know, he just recently went through something where, you know, he went through a little breakup and, um, you know, I, I could tell that that took a toll on him emotionally. So, you know, I just try to give him some insight, you know, give him a little bit of, uh, of advice, you know, and just, you know, just hope that, you know, he, he kind of like takes heed to some of the things that I say, you know, so. So you went in when he was three months old? He was three months old. Yeah. And then just over visitation and time, you'd seen him all throughout his growing up kind of thing? Off and on. Yeah, off and on. Yeah. Um, by the time he was 12, he had started getting in trouble with the law. I have not physically touched my son since he was 12 years old. Oh, man. Yeah, since he was 12 years old. Um, I have, let me show you something real quick. Um, Man, that's just hitting me, you saying that, that you haven't physically touched your son in 10 years, 11. Yeah, since then. Since then. Yeah, since I, yeah. It's been a long time. Yeah. But you guys are, you guys are obviously close. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, everybody has their moments, you know, we don't, we don't argue. We don't argue. You know what I mean? If he's pissed off at me, then I, I, I get it. He gets quiet for a while, you know, or, or he might not call for a couple of days, but you know, everybody has their moments, but we what do would, not argue. What would he get mad about you advising him or. Uh, no, not, not so much that, you know, he, he tends to take the advice a lot. Uh, uh, just maybe, you know, sometime if he, if he doesn't, if he can't get a hold of me because I'm at work or, you know, I know that upsets him a little bit and things like if I don't always, I don't always see eye to eye with his mother, you know, um, uh, she's doing the best that she could, you know, and I, I understand that it's hard. But my son was raised in my neighborhood, man. And it's it's like, it, I'm trying to get that crap out of his head. You know, and she's still there. You know, everyone's trying to convince her to move to Florida. You know, and she's actually in Florida visiting her family right now. And um, she has two younger kids. One of them is a teenager, but then she has uh, an eight-year-old. He's eight or nine. I think he's nine. And it's like, you know... Um, <laughs> If if you don't get your kids out of that environment, what do you think is going to happen? You've witnessed it firsthand, mm-hmm. you know. So um, it, it's hard for some people to leave. Yeah, it really is. I mean, even at this point right now, you know, Long Beach is an hour and fifteen minutes from where I'm at right now, and I go out there periodically. You know, I do get a little homesick, but as soon as I get out there and I see what it is, you know, the environment where I grew up at. It's like, I can't wait to get the hell out of that place. Yeah. How did, how did you choose where you're living now? Uh, My, my, my spouse, my wife lives out here. So this was, you know, um, and you got married to her while you were incarcerated. Well incarcerated. That's correct. We got married in 2013. Yeah. But we had been together for some years before that. Yeah. Like, and how did that relationship develop? Um, just communicating with one another, you know, just started out as a friendship, mm-hmm. you know, and just being able to communicate with one another and whatnot. And, um, we just, we hit it off really good. And, you know, she's, she's been there. She yeah. really has. So yeah. then she would come in and physically see you too. Oh yeah. 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 Every weekend yeah, every, for years. Yeah. And I mean, don't get me wrong. Everybody has their problems. Everybody goes through what we go through. And, yeah. you know, I'm no exception to the rule, but I hear you. Uh, um, she's been there. Yeah. Has it been nice? You know, I know, just like you said, you have the waves of 
unexpected um, transition and getting used yeah. to, to this new life being two years um, out. So, you know, I'm sure there was some lots of adjustment in your relationship too, since it I lived a, oh, yeah. a certain way for seven years. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, um, it, yeah, it's different. Um, you know, when you live with somebody. So, uh, one thing that works for me, no matter what the situation is, no matter what, uh, ordeal I encounter out here that I go through, I remind myself of what I've been through. And it's like, I embrace my problems, man. I don't, I don't care what it is. Um, I love my problems and I'm extremely grateful that my problems are not, uh, uh, coinciding on that prison yard anymore. You know, I'm not worried about when is the next riot going to pop off or, you know, um, I'm laying on the ground on, you know, in the concrete because this guy just cut this guy's throat and I was on my way to a visit. Mm -hmm. And here I am, you know, still laying here a few hours later because, you know, it's a crime scene now. And it's like, you know, I love my problems, man. I, yeah, yeah everything I've encountered since I've been out. And, you know, if I, I, I try to share that, uh, 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 notion with a lot of people too, you know, that have been through what I go through, what I've been through. And it's like, you know, embrace what you have, no matter what it is, because, you know, the, the, the further you look into it, I guarantee if you're paying attention, there's something good up in there. Yeah. How do you, uh, do you ever get kind of bitter of people that don't have a, just like don't have a perspective and they're just in this, you know, they're mulling and, and dramatizing and, and just over a shit that you're just like, you just are like, oh my, it just doesn't matter. Like you almost, I could only imagine you like, man, like you have no idea how bad things can be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, initially I did, but with me being able to, uh, practice the concept of, uh, uh, or grasp the concept of everybody is going to be who everybody is, you know, who, whoever you are as a person, that's who you are. And however you choose to think that's, that's on you. It's, you know, I could share with you. And if you don't get it, then maybe one day you will, if not, then more power to you. Yeah. You know, I try not to hang on or dwell on things too much anymore. I really don't. Right, because it um, just doesn't. It's kind of like you saying before in our conversation of worrying about everybody else. It's just it just doesn't serve you. It doesn't serve you, and it doesn't serve anybody else around you that you could possibly no. impact. No, um, no, it, it's like it, it, if one individual isn't getting it, or it, it's usually because they choose not to. You know, if you want the change, then it's going to come. You know, you're going to approach it and it's going to be there. We're here, you know, whenever you're ready, if you are ready, if not, I don't hold any grudges. I don't feel bitter. I, you know, this is life. And uh, one thing I can share uh, that a lot of people don't realize, and all of us have heard this old saying, is time is of the essence. Time is very, very very precious mm. and a lot of people lose sight of that you yeah. know um i'm in a place where i don't overlook a lot of the things that i took for granted even if it's me driving along the coast and just that view you know i've had that view bring tears to my eyes i hear you man i watched some of your videos of you doing these hiking trips which that's sweet, yeah you know, where you can kind of see where yeah you're and then you're just up there and i'm just like man that's what's up like just man it's breathtaking embracing the gratitude and stuff man i i sometimes i get in these down times and it's like a snowball when I'm in that downtime, because I'm like, man, I don't even actually have anything to be down about. And sometimes I can beat myself up over that. 
of yeah. you know, that people have it worse. And it's like, I get addicted to that negativity and the, oh, like, and, and it's, oh man, just what, you know, I believe, I do believe in this kind of affirmation law of attraction thing, but, I, but it doesn't mean that it's, uh, it's positive or negative. It'll go either yeah. way. If you, if you deposit in some type of direction, it'll keep giving you more of that direction. It's of it's course, biased, you know, so of course, I think some people forget that when they get to talking all this positivity and this, that, and the other. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, it works for bad people too, you know, and yeah. doing bad things. I mean, it, you, the more you do, the more negative you see, the more you get, you know, and, yeah. and it also works the other way. And uh, it's something else to keep to some kind of program to keep yourself um, going, man. And uh, yeah, man, I just, I appreciate you. I feel like, you know, we've been on here uh, almost a couple hours just to spend some time together and, and you never know where that leads or, or why, why we started connecting. Yeah. And me, you know, I kind of got the, just talking to you and it's like yesterday out of nowhere. I don't know why, just like six in the morning. I'm like, what's up with you, man? Like, what are you doing? Yeah. You know? And it just, yeah. I mean, that could be a spiritual thing or not. I don't even know. You know, yeah. it's, it's cool that uh, it takes a certain amount of courage or willingness uh, in your, in your path too, to be like, yeah, I'll jump on whatever. whatever yeah, of course. Is. Yeah, definitely. You know, no expectations or whatever. And uh, I hope we can, keep in touch man like man definitely do something yeah definitely i mean i think you sharing your story just like all of us man that's what we have is uh the you know thank god the willingness come by somehow whatever you got to go through when when you have that willingness to to look outside yourself and give and and also the willingness to put yourself first because everybody thinks being selfish is so bad. It's actually not. The more you work on yourself, the yeah. better you are for everyone else. Yeah. You. So yeah. It's a little ba- you know, it's a little backwards in actuality, it seems like. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I mean, that's, you know, like I said, it boils down to, you know, time is precious. You know, if, if I'm feeling down and, you know, I, will end up reaching a point where I'm like, you know, this isn't helping, you know, I need to figure out what I need to do to get past this little hump. Yeah. You know, and we have a choice. We have a choice, you know, um, I think we as humans tend to allow the things that other people do to get under our skin in a negative way. And it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, it really doesn't. You know what I mean? Is if whatever someone else is doing isn't hurting you, keep it pushing, man. Yeah, you know, wish them the best, and you know, have good intentions. And if somebody wants the help, it's here. You know, I mean, uh, hurt people, hurt people. Helped people, help people. Right. Yeah. 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 And some of those hurt people can uh transition into the other side of things oh definitely help people yeah. for sure. most well, definitely man. well man let's uh i'll just say your name again we got jimmy vigil here thank you so much for for uh spreading your experience and your your uh your love and hope and stuff like i think it's i think we just we we uh other people will, will experience empathy and being heard by just telling your story, you know, if we just tell stories and, and model the best of our ability, where we are in our growth of how to hear each other, yeah. especially when you're different, like it's, it's totally cool. It's totally fine. You know, I think, uh, I think it makes a difference. It, it definitely makes a difference. I'm going to keep trucking along and doing my thing i mean i got nervous right before we got on i'm just like oh i just get that nervous feeling like yeah you know, yeah you know you you want things to go well and at the same time you got to do your own work of acceptance of like let it let things happen 
and, and try your best not to control everything so much. Yeah, I'm, I'm as bad as anybody else. I get in there strategizing, trying to make yeah. <laughs> I try to make yeah. life work for me. You know how that is, but yeah, it just that humility thing. Whenever that comes yeah. by and gets you, it seems like it doesn't mean it's all rainbows and stuff and ha- happy. It, it, but it's definitely a pure spot that that feels like I could be the most useful. One hundred percent, and and you know, for whatever it's worth, man, this you 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 did great. I, I really enjoy doing this with you right here uh you know your structure is good so you know you're asking the questions you're taking everything in and um uh, uh i've done this uh a couple times since i've been home yeah um and yeah man this this is awesome i really appreciate the time too yeah absolutely brother well i hope to uh let's let's just keep chatting man like keep in touch and definitely who knows we'll cross paths in different ways yeah definitely man definitely and there's so many different things that i could touch on too if there's uh uh, you know a different topic or something you want to speak on next time or something and you know yeah yeah just let me know and we'll we'll arrange it you know i'm I'm also down with if you have other people that you want to bring in you want to try to make this grow let me know i'm here i'm here for sure yeah i'm I'm open to any of your ideas or uh I'm just starting, you know what I mean? Like okay, I let, yeah. I'm letting this thing, me and my wife, uh, she's kind of shy, but we, we started it together and, and she's on some of the episodes too. And, and I have a goal to, uh, make it about the journey and, and, yeah. and know that it's going to ebb and flow. Cause like, man, I, my insecurities, it's like, I want to, I want to figure out how to do something so well in the dark and then show something good. Whereas really with this, man, I just want to show up and like keep showing up and like, you know, uh, I'll find the, I'll find the direction and and the people that we can impact or help kind of that 12 step thing just by attraction and, and, and get out the way basically. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Which is super way easier said than done. So, so I'm open to any, uh, ideas you have or um anybody you think we could talk with or 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 connect okay like whatever you know what i mean all right definitely at the very least me and you just jump on here again and yeah do it again or as many yeah man i'm down for that i'm completely open for that um i'll speak i'll speak with my boy too with monster yo and you know uh, uh should i get you uh you know, a little interview with him from up in there, you know, he's sitting up in there. So, yeah. um, he does a lot of work from up in that cell, man, but, uh, he always, he'll make time. Yeah. dude. Yeah. He'll I'm, definitely make time. I'm open to anything that, uh, you know, just developing our friendship and stuff and, and, uh, however it shows up is cool. Awesome. Yes, sir. All right, brother. Have a good day. Oh, and, and likewise. All right, man. All right. Thank you, Chad. Have a good one, bro. You too, man. Hello, everyone. Thanks for listening. We have a request for you. Please make sure to follow us and leave a review on whatever platform you are listening on. If you want to send us a message, our email is hello at empathyjampodcast.com. And also find us on social media at Empathy Jam Podcast. Empathy is my jam, 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 jam.